We will come through this as we have through other troubles. There is a strength in us that we ourselves have not yet recognized. And one day, we will find a place in the world for our people again. I tell everyone here, that is how it will be. Obima. There's a lot of hatred I've built up towards the place because people there, they seem to not realize what alcohol is doing to our people. I'm still young and I want more out of life than what I've had in the past eight years. I've been drinking since I was 12. Dropped out of school because of alcohol. When I turned 16, I went to jail. And being in jail, I grew a bitterness. I was very defensive towards people. Last year, I was put away for 18 months. And I'm just getting out. And I'm nervous about being on my own. At times, like, I'm so confused, I don't know where to turn to. Our people, the original owners of the land, have been displaced by the newcomers and for many generations have been forced to live in an environment of self-destruction and despair. Laws in the Indian Act have robbed generations of their identity and culture. We are now living the horrifying results of a long chapter of racism, oppression, rejection, betrayal, and of great loss. Thousands of our people live in the cities of our country and are not welcome there, nor are they welcome at home. They live in the shadow of two worlds. Apple wine stole my brother from those he loved the most. I see him almost everywhere, looking like a ghost. I asked about his failing health, he says, oh, I fake fine. But could you spare a dollar for a taste of apple wine? You know, my brother drank himself through many kinds of bars. Lived on dreams and empty schemes of owning fancy cars. When the dealer came to him, he signed upon the line. What did I learn about drinking from my dad? I learned to drink, get drunk, pass out. That's what I learned from my grandfather also. And what did the first Indians learn about alcohol from the first white men? It was here, have more booze so we can get your land. Here, have more booze so that we can get your woman. Here, have more booze so that we can get your furs. You know, drink, you get drunk, and we'll, we'll take whatever you have. So basically, that's, that's the way our forefathers learned to drink. That's the way I think it's continued for a long time. Poundmaker's Lodge is located in St. Albert, just north of Edmonton in Alberta. It was created for our people, lost in a world of alcohol and drugs. Here, they can begin to heal with the help of their own people and regain a sense of belonging to traditions they have been deprived of for so long. We're more than just bows and arrows. We've got a rich tradition, we've got a rich history, we've got a lot of things to be proud about the, in our culture. Since 1982, Pat Shirt has been the director of Poundmaker's Lodge, founded by his brother Eric in 1973. 
He is 35 years old. He himself has known the destructive world of alcohol and has refrained from drinking for the past 13 years. So those are some of the values that we're trying to look at here, you know, the caring, the sharing, the kindness, and the being good to one another. Most people come to Palmaker's Lodge through referrals from community alcoholism programs, prisons, shelters, doctors, and social workers. <laughs> the door is open to everyone as long as they have been sober for 48 hours before entering the lodge. Their stay will last 30 days. When they leave, Pawnmaker will help them to establish contacts for support. When I was nine, my father, my father committed suicide, and he committed suicide by an overdose of pills. Me, me, and my brother, and my sister were all sleeping. Same bed as mother, and uh, my mom wanted my dad to come to bed, but he wouldn't. So we just left them. Then when dad, I mean, when mom woke up to uh, ask dad to come to come to bed, she found him sitting on a chair, bent over, uh, died. I mean, dead. We went to the funeral. For some reason, other people seen the body. But me, I I hated to see it because uh, I knew that my that my favorite person on earth was dead. And to this day, still makes me mad why I, why you had to commit suicide. Because now I always feel like no one really I always feel like no one really cares about me no more. I don't have no one. To, talk to now because we always used to we always used to share our feelings every time he was sober alcohol was introduced by the early european explorers and fur traders not as a social drink but as a poison as the government came into being so did its policy of de-indianizing the people all traditions and rituals were banned. By the mid-1800s, children were being forced into mission and residential schools. They were forbidden from speaking their language for the next hundred years. Here at Palmaker's Lodge, our people have a chance to look at what has happened in the past. They begin to grow free from alcohol and drugs and can commence to recover their lives. And uh, it's only a beginning, you know, because I, I know one of the things that I had to do in a sense of my own recovery <coughs> is finding out more about, about myself and finding out more about my own, my, own, uh, my own roots, so to speak. When you were younger, did you drink? I think I was in grade six when I passed out in the class. It hurt my family, it hurt me. You know, I got into five car accidents where it rolled, you know, got kicked out of three high schools, ended up in a whole bunch of jails and that sort of thing, just because of my drinking. I took my first drink when I was three and a half. And then after that, and then after that, I liked it, I liked it a whole bunch. And so every time my dad and them would bring a book, have a party over at our place, we'd always, we'd always sneak out a couple of bottles. That was when I first started, first started. And then after that, just last year, I started to get into heavy stuff, drugs, marijuana, cocaine, you, you name it, I did it. I guess it was just to get the problems, the problems on my way. But after, but after I did it, they didn't help me out. And then it was just last, last Friday, I planned on committing suicide. I, 
I was over at the tracks and the and then the train was coming. And then I jumped off the track to wait until the train got a little closer. And just as soon as I was about to jump, I thought, what's this gonna do? It isn't gonna solve nothing. Since I've told my primary group about what happened, they've come a long way to help me. And so has Palmaker's Lodge. Ten years ago, we had the alcoholic coming in. He was 35, 40 years old. Nowadays, the average age of the alcoholics coming here is 25. And that makes it more dangerous, I think, in the sense of, of looking at our native community, is because um, the kids are starting to drink and use alcohol much younger. I started going to foster homes when I was about 10 years old. I can't remember exactly how many, because it was when I was that young, they were moving me so much. Eh? Like there wasn't anything steady. It was just, just like you lay over for a couple of weeks and then you move again. Eh? There was quite a few. I was going to school on a school bus. And I was sitting up in front talking to a bus driver. I heard the, like a news flash. Eh? There was a murder suicide in my reserve. And I gave the, gave the names to my, of my parents. And my sisters were witness to that too. Well, my mom was getting beat with a rifle stock. They were hiding under the bed. And my dad passed out when he woke up in the morning. He uh, realized what he'd done and he went and strung himself up. I was 12 years old at the time. And I started yelling and screaming. I threw a fit. And I told him I wanted to go home. I wanted to go, go to the funeral. Social worker, their system, I don't know. They said, no, I couldn't go. I never trusted anything of authority after that. So I just rebelled. The more I rebelled, the worse I got. Drank, did drugs. Just got more, more into violence than that. Started doing all my times here. My last bits have been all violent charges. I never really had anybody I could talk to, eh? Until I came here and then everybody was so open, so caring and they share, eh? Yeah, I made quite a few friends here. We pray for the loved ones. We left at home. We loved us. I would like them to go back to Cutknife Hill, to the place where the Crees can feel proud again. Tell them to gather the sweet grass, to watch the sun as it rises and sets, and to hear the wind whisper in the lodge poles. Tell them to sit in the firelight and sing our songs and retell the old stories, because that is how we here will be thinking of them. We are locked away, but there are no chains or walls that can lock away our hearts or our thoughts. In that way, we will always be with them. Most Indians don't want to be unemployed. I do know that most Indians don't want to have a lot of violence and a lot of violent deaths and a lot of accidents. I know that Indians don't want a lot of fetal alcohol syndromes, but they have the most. I know that Indians don't want to die an early death, but they do die an early death. I know that Indians don't want poor housing. I know that Indians don't want to be on welfare, but once they become alcoholic, that's where they are. Alcohol is not the only poison. Paint thinner, cleaning fluid, hairspray, cooking spray, antifreeze, gasoline and glue are just part of an unimaginable variety of substances consumed. And that's, that's part of it now, you know, you have a harder time. You know, we didn't have the cocaine, we didn't have the heroin, we didn't have the hashes and the marijuana, and, and, and that's now on our reserves. What we had was the vanilla extract and <laughs> shaving lotion. <laughs> and now they've got more too, of course. They got the Lysol. And all that. Yeah. He thought he was laughing from the bottle at his fears. But he knows that he was running as he wasted through the years. 
The question is, my brother John, you sure you feeling fine? Try your apples from the tree before they turn to wine. Apple wine just fills the belly, but it leaves an empty soul. Going up, you feel so warm. Coming down, it leaves you cold. Now and then, you think of when the way your spirit died. Some call it accidental. Some call it suicide. My family, you know, they're Métis. They were struggling, and it was it was tough times for our family. But we were all together. I don't know. I don't know why that happened. Like I was taken away, all, along with my brothers and one sister. Just one day, a welfare car pulled up, and uh, that was the last of the family. It just disintegrated. There was no family after that, and that was about 1956. And where were you taken? To uh, several foster homes for the next three years, three, four years, and it'd be, I'd say, about 10. And they were right in the vicinity of Lac La Biche. And they're all to white people. They had farms, cattle, things like that, eh? And they put us to work, working for them. And they had children of their own, but they were treated quite differently than the way we were treated. And I can remember, you know, nights when we had to sleep outside in barns while their, their own children slept inside after working. And we weren't fed at a table. We were brought food to us. And it wasn't what the same, the same food that the children would eat with their parents at the table. But I ran away from those places. When I went back to my parents after 12 years in a white world, I'd become alienated from my own people. I'd forgotten my language. I was not the same Lawrence that left there at six, that returned at 18. My parents be were afraid of me because all of a sudden I represented everything that they'd feared. And the thing that they feared most was anything that was white. Because it caused them pain and shame. Fear, put fear in their hearts. And so I was rejected and uh, I came to Edmonton. I didn't have an identity, no language, no mother or father, no brothers and sisters, no God, because I would lost them. I took a razor blade and I tried to take my own life. I, I didn't know what else to do. At Palm Maker, the people take part in one of the most ancient rituals, the sweat lodge. For thousands of years, the lodge has brought comfort and purification to those who enter. The fire represents the sun, which gives life to all forms. The stones represent Mother Earth and the unending nature of the Great Spirit. As I enter the sweat lodge, I am part of the circle of life and wish to be cleansed of the storm of terrors. I feel spiritual ties to all creation as I walk out and all is clear, that is my medicine. I do care for my brothers and sisters. I love them. That's why I learned. That's why I learned through this program. How to love, how to love them, how to understand them. 
When you say brothers and sisters, does that mean us? Like, are you referring the to the whole people? the group I meet? <clears throat> like mean? the group in here, the group out there. I start to open up to see what I say. I heard when we pray, or I pray. I just sort of I consider us on as my brothers and sisters. I heard the word love. You mean to say that you really love us all? I won't say I love you all, but I'm working on how to love each individual of you, one of you. I'm not saying I'm going to love that whole, the whole, the world, but I'm trying to make my hard work, my 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 whole thing work towards you people would understand me, because I don't want no. I've been hurting people so many years, and I don't want to hurt them anymore. I want to understand. I want you to understand me who I am. Mm -hmm. I want to understand you who you are. Came from a large family, and we were really poor, because my dad drank it. Eh? I don't know, we had a miserable childhood. It has scarred me, you know, like I've lived in fear. Like I came to a point in my life where I just didn't want to live no more. Like the world just looked too ugly. Then I had two two daughters. I thought, what will they think, you know, when, when they grow up and they found out that you know, their mom committed suicide? What will my family go through? I had a hard time. Um, understanding my identity and who I was. I hated the fact that I was an Indian. I thought, well, maybe this is happening to me because I'm an Indian. One evening I was... I'd been up for about four days and um, we were partying over at, <clears throat> at a friend's place and uh, we took a taxi to um, go downtown to the Empire and um, we're just getting out of the taxi and all of a sudden the taxi door opens and there, there my mom was standing, you know. I got out and I was really surprised. I looked at her and I said, Mom, I said, what are you doing here? I shed tears in her eyes. She, looks, she looked at me and she said, what are you doing to yourself? She said, come, I'll take you home. And I said, no, you know, I'm not, I can't go back home with you. So I went running down the street and I hid in this apartment building. And you know, like that kind of jerked me back to reality. And I thought, you know, like I'm not only destroying myself, but there are people who care about me. And um, I guess in my own, like in my, like I was so obsessed with, with, with the drugs and the alcohol that I forgot about these people who loved me. You know, I can't let these people down. I can't let my children down. Although at the time I never thought much of myself. But now, like, you know, to this day, I really believe that people love you back to good health. What makes it really hard for me is that I've never seen love in my life. Uh, I've never seen it in my childhood days. I've never had my mom come up to hug me. Maybe the odd time she'd come and put her arm around me and tell me, be strong, you know. The only time I've seen really love is, is coming to here. I was in a boarding school uh, in my younger days. And when I returned back home, there's a lot Lots of alcohol eh, in the family. I can't forget how it was, you know. I'd be sitting outside and my my dad would be inside. He'd be swearing at my mom, calling me a legitimate kid. I couldn't figure out why he didn't accept me. My other real dad, he deserted me when I was three. These things, they're still in my mind. <laughs> I have to bring him out and learn to deal with him. I'm a full grown man. These things, they're beaten into me. I tried to drown him with alcohol, and it only led me to a lot of trouble. I asked the great spirits to take him from me. And I believe that he watches me. I believe that if he, if I show him I want to go the right way, he'll help me. But someday I'll be strong enough to overcome everything.
Indians were on this land and the white people came from across the ocean. They came here in their boats with their Bible, with their priests and missionaries. And they wanted to translate the Bible into Cree and they didn't know an equivalent word for sin. So they went to the elders and asked the elders, tell us what is the equivalent of sin in your language in Cree. The elders didn't, the Indians didn't have a word for sin. The closest the elders could return with the word, the closest one was Pastawan. And our children are our future. And when you shatter those lives of the children, when you shatter our future, that is Pastawan. That's a sin. Ambition to me means to be able to lead a good and useful life, to be useful to my people, to find peace and contentment by sharing. That's ambition to me. That's the value of ambition to my people. We're champions, that we have the ability to make it in this world and still retain our own society, our own culture, our own beliefs and our own values. Since Pond Maker's Lodge began, hundreds of people have walked away with a different vision of themselves and a feeling of wanting to know more about the greatness and truth of the old traditions and values. While there will still be hardship to face, they have made a step forward away from the misery of alcoholism. Over the years, not only have hundreds of people recovered their lives, but in time have offered their love and understanding to others, both at Pond Maker and in their home communities. You are the same people who fought so well and bravely on Cut Knife Hill, but you are going to have to fight again, the hardest kind of fight. You must fight yourselves and this new way of thinking that we are less than they are. Because it is not true. Right now, I am prouder than I ever was before that I am a Cree. <laughs> <laughs> 